Welcome to the Dog Nerd Show, where we geek out over our best friends. I'm Megan. And I'm Michael, and this is a show about all things dog. Hey, everybody. As promised, we have a full episode on Chagas disease. We talked to Dr. Roy Madigan, who is an expert on the disease and has been studying it for over 18 years. Yeah, so without further ado, let's jump on into that interview. Today, we are joined by Dr. Roy Madigan from the Animal Hospital of Smithson Valley in the San Antonio, Texas area. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are doing a deeper dive on Chagas disease. We talked about it in a brief episode right after I came back from the Texas Pet Sitters Conference. And we're so glad to hear you talk about it because I know our listeners and viewers probably have a lot of questions that um, I know you're well versed in. So tell us a little bit about Chagas disease and why we need to be concerned about it for our pets. Yeah. And before you do that, tell, tell people a little bit about you and kind of your background and, and that sort of thing too. So that they kind of see where, where you're coming from and, and your credentials, if you will. Yeah. Well, and thank you guys. First of all, I want to say thank you for having me on the show and happy to spread good knowledge about Chagas disease and dogs. It's very important just as pet owners to know what's going on out there for your pets. You want the best for them. You love them. And uh, this just gives you some good information to walk around with to help them stay healthier and longer and, uh, and live a good, happy life. Excellent. So, you know, what, what I've done, you know, um, in, in my career, I've been a veterinarian for 21 years. I graduated from Texas A&M um, a long time ago. And um, I've been in Central Texas for the entire time practicing medicine. And, um, you know, it, it, we're in a little suburb of San Antonio. And, um, you know, little did I know back in the day when I was in veterinary school that I would be. Um, confronting this disease on a daily basis, and that's no exaggeration, uh, and not, not being a specialist, not having any special magical powers about myself, it's just living in the area where these, where this disease is, and where what we call the vectors are, and right. so, you know, a good, a good understanding of Chagas disease requires really to understand, you know, what it is, you know, what, what is this, what is this disease, and technically it's a parasite, okay, and you guys as pet owners, you're probably familiar with going to the veterinarian once a year and having a heartworm test. That's the most common parasite in the blood that we deal with. And um, we also check the poop of your dogs and your cats on a routine basis. So why do we do that? Well, it's because um, you know, if you've been a dog owner for more than a day, you know that they like to eat things that are pretty disgusting, um, mm -hmm. including, um, including cat turds. I mean, it's a delicacy in the dog world. Maybe they know something we don't, I don't know, but- uh, I'll but take their word on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Outside of the, the cat turd fetish that, that most dogs have, um, they, they do eat things off the ground and they're constantly exposed to, to intestinal parasites. And that's why we that's why we check for parasites. And, you know, when you get a cute little puppy and you're loving on them, kissing on them, you know, it's the first thing that we do as veterinarians is to check for that because they can also get parasites from mom, um, you know, through the milk or through the placenta. I mean, these are just things that these parasites have adapted to. It's just reality, the reality we live in. Um, and then we have this special category of diseases um, or parasites that we call vector-borne diseases, okay? Vector implies that they have a vector that transmits those diseases. So vector-borne diseases that we're all familiar with, that we've heard of in the news before, at least as it pertains to humans, would be like malaria, okay? That's a real big one, you know, not too common in the United States, but yeah. certainly malaria is a vector-borne disease. Um, sleeping sickness, you might have heard of that before, or if you've uh, ever considered being a mom, or if you are a mom, you know, toxoplasmosis, that's another uh, parasite or vector-borne disease that we see. So a lot of the vectors that we deal with on a daily basis are fleas, okay, ticks. I mean, those are nasty creatures, and they carry a lot of disgusting, um, you know, parasites that they can, uh, they can transmit. So um, Chagas disease is one of those vector-borne diseases, okay, and specifically, the vector for Chagas disease is a bug called the kissing bug. And uh, kissing bugs are like a cross between a cockroach and a mosquito, a giant mosquito. And they, they fly, they crawl. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, these, these vectors feed on blood of mammals, okay? And these kissing bugs are no exception to that. They, they suck blood. They hone in on carbon dioxide emissions. So they're like the ultimate stealth assassin. And mm -hmm. um, they, they, they find any, anything that's exhaling, it's fair game. OK, and so inside of these vectors or these kissing bugs is where a little bitty parasite, a microscopic parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi, 
That's the agent that causes Chagas disease. That's where it lives, okay? And it lives inside the gut of these vectors. And so when this vector or this kissing bug takes a blood meal, sucks the blood of a mammal, um, it's very interesting, it will defecate, okay? So it poops and as it's defecating, these parasites get passed through the intestinal tract and they make their way into this little wound that they just created. Now, remember, it's like a mosquito bite. It's a tiny little wound. It's not like it's cutting you or making a big hole, but those parasites migrate from this poop, the super poop, and it goes right into the bloodstream, and then it goes everywhere inside the body of the host. So in this case, because we're talking about dogs and cats, companion animals, it will go inside of their bloodstream, goes through all the white blood cells, and then it settles out in certain organs, okay? So that, that's kind of it in a nutshell as far as how they get Chagas disease, okay? After this organism establishes its little home inside the body, it starts to divide and replicate. Basically, it has babies, okay? And after it has babies, those babies circulate in the bloodstream, and then the kissing bug takes another blood meal, like a different kissing bug flies in, takes a blood meal, and gets more babies inside of it. And so the cycle continues. Okay. This is like a so, horror movie. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. Yeah. And, and that's, that's like the classical transmission, you know, and, and just like other parasites, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to catch Chagas disease. So one of the other very, very common ways that dogs catch Chagas disease is by eating or ingesting that vector, those bugs. And again, if you're a seasoned dog owner, you know that they, they have this, this thing called prey drive and anything smaller than them is fair game, especially if it's crunchy and it tastes good. Yeah. So these dogs will eat bugs left and right. Um, they can also catch Chagas disease through mom. Okay. We call that vertical transmission. So from mom to baby, um, so they can cross the placenta and go into the milk. Um, and then the last thing, which is pretty uncommon, but some dogs, you know, have been exposed to blood transfusions before, we can also give it to them. So for instance, our blood bank, um, we've got numerous blood banks, but West Coast, East Coast are kind of the more, more common ones. Um, you're not testing for Chagas disease, you get a, a unit of blood, you, your dog gets a blood transfusion, you, your dog could catch it through that as well, blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's kind of it in a nutshell um, on transmission of, of Chagas disease. So would this be a good time to show that first slide? That would be great. And I'll okay. kind of, you know, do a little quick rehash on it and everybody can see and I have a couple what that looks like. I have a couple of questions. I'll let you go through this because you may as long as you just let me know that you see this. Uh, yeah, we got it. Okay, cool. Right. You have a question? Okay. Well, I'm going to let you go ahead and explain this, but I do have a couple of questions that I would, I do want to ask. Okay. And they're probably dumb, but I'm going to ask them anyway. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No problem. It's, it's, it's an intriguing disease. Uh, we'll see what you can see. We'll start with the, the elephant in the room. That's that nasty looking creature up in the right hand corner. So that's the kissing bug and it's kind of transparent. You can see the little, uh, the little parasites inside of it. So basically you've got this kissing bug. It takes a blood meal. Okay. And this dog is apparently sleeping whenever it gets bit, <laughs> uh, but you can see the little left uh, box right there. It's kind of like a zoomed in view and you can see the red blood cells circulating through and you can see some poop oozing through there. That's that yeah. brown black stuff oh, oozing wow, through the yeah. skin. Uh, I hope it's not that big, but um, so the parasite, you know, leaves the feces, gets into the, uh, to the circulation. Okay. And from there, it's a highway. It goes every, it literally goes everywhere. It's like cancer. It goes to every single organ and um, it has a propensity for the heart. Chagas does. That's this little trypomastigote. Just remember trypomastigote is a fancy name for baby. Okay. That's the baby Chagas bug. And it goes into the heart. It settles into the heart and it completely transforms its phase from this little trypomastigote, which is the baby. And it goes into this cyst phase. Okay. We call that an a mastigote. Again, it's a mouthful, but it's like eggs. Okay. And inside those eggs, all they're doing is dividing and replicating and dividing and replicating. And then you can see from the left circle right there, as soon as it reach, reaches critical mass, so there's, there's no more room, those eggs burst, okay? And they pop the cell like a virus does, and it kills that cell. So in this case, it's killing that heart cell. Now, you lose a couple heart cells, big deal, big deal. But to have thousands of heart cells that die, you can imagine you're going to run out of real estate pretty quickly and that heart's going to 
go south. And that's exactly what happens. But as it releases these babies, it, it converts back over from the cis phase over to the baby phase. And then it goes back into the bloodstream and back up to that box. You can see where it's circulating up. And, and all a bug has to do is take a blood meal, sucks up some of those babies, and then it continues that cycle. Wow. So, you know, you said it was in all mammals. Is it transferable? So let's just say a cow gets this and we decide we're going to go have a steak. Is it transferable that way? Uh, does cooking it kill it? Um, what, how, how are, you know, we feed our dog, you know, raw, a raw diet. Could, could they get it that way? I mean, what are, I know you mentioned a couple of transferences, but could it go that way too? Right. That, that's a fantastic question. So fortunately, um, the, that cyst phase, so the amastigotes that are in the tissues is a non-infective phase, okay? So you could eat those all day and you're not going to get it, okay? okay? Now, the trypamastigotes, the little babies, that are that's the infective phase, okay? It's not going to replicate, but that's how it penetrates into our tissues. So technically, if we ate undercooked or pretty much raw um, infected meat and, and with blood, lots of blood, we could get infected, okay? Right. It's not transmitted that way though, okay? We just don't see it that way. And what that means, you know, that's a fancy way of saying that it's, it just really stinks at transmitting that way, okay? Um, mm -hmm. the, the preferred method of transmission is through that kissing bug, okay? So I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, one of the ways that's, that's kind of theorized that dogs can get Chagas disease is by eating carrion. And carrion, again, another different word. It's just, just you know, a roadkill, basically. Right, so something yeah. dies and they go eat it and they get it that way. So like in Texas, armadillo, uh, which is our, I think it's our, you know, our state animal, um, <laughs> the yeah. armadillo. Awesome like, on the half shell. Yeah, awesome on the half shell. But you want to cook that really well. So, <laughs> so, so nine, check this out. 90% of armadillo have Chagas, okay, and they carry it. So, you know, my dogs love to chase armadillo because they come yeah. in our yard, they tear things up, and man, they go nuts. So those, those, those animals, you know, if they were to be killed by my dog, would have a very high risk of, of getting fresh, you know, because they're getting the blood and everything mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah. But like eating a steak, you're, you're okay. I mean, you know, feedlot cattle, they're, they're not going to have, they're not going to have Chagas disease. Okay. Now I can't really speak for outside the U.S. Um, you know, the, the, the kissing bugs don't really go for cattle in those really high density areas, because I don't know if you've ever been to a feedlot West Texas, there's really, I mean, it's, it's just dirt and pins and that's it. There's just, there's nowhere that these bugs could replicate and hide and things like that. So, right. but again, in Central and South America, where numbers of Chagas disease are, are um, at, at the very least equal to what we have in South Texas or higher, um, you know, that might be a concern for them, you know, eating, eating raw meat and things. Um, for humans, though, um, oral transmission can happen, okay, but it seems to be either one, number one, accidentally, so um, incorporating bug feces or a bug inadvertently while you're making juice, okay, that's, that's been documented in elementary school kids with gava berries, um, they accidentally incorporated some feces or a bug and they transmitted Chagas to 60 kids, okay, that's happened. Um, you know, the other way is the making of a drink, and I've never had it, but I'm well, I might want to try it maybe if I heat it up, but, but this, this concoction called palm wine, like a palm tree, palm wine, and it's made inside of a palm tree. And that's, that's a known way that Chagas can be transmitted because the bugs are attracted to that, uh, that, I guess, material and so right. they'll defecate in there and then the people will drink it and boom, they'll get Chagas disease. So I think you guys are okay as far as oral transmission, uh, feeding raw diets and things like that. I think you're going to be okay when it comes to Chagas. Right. So um, do humans get it from being bitten as well, though? Right. That's that's a great question. So, you know, first of all, disclaimer, you know, there's never been a case where a person had got got Chagas from their dog. OK, so it's yeah. just not going to happen that way. Now um, it's going to be the next question. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So don't please don't get rid of your dogs. If they have Chagas. <laughs> OK, um, but, uh, you know. The, again, the classic transmission, at least in humans, although it can happen with oral transmission, is through this bug bite with mm -hmm. defecation, okay? And, and, you know, again, the way we're incorrectly taught in veterinary school 
is that, you know, Chagas disease is a disease of third world countries. It's a disease of poverty. I have to live in a thatched hut um, with mud walls before I'm at risk. And that's com been completely debunked, by the way, now that industrialization has happened in all the major cities in Central and South America. They have even more Chagas disease now in their cities than they did in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. So that that's completely, you know, completely wrong. But um, you know, the classic transmission would be these palm trees, going back to palm trees, apparently shy, or kissing bugs love palm trees, but these, these palm tree workers that would go and cut uh, harvest palm trees, they would make their hammocks uh, in these, these layers. And they say so they stack them on top of each other between palm trees and everything. So at night, the bugs would climb down, they would feast on the palm tree workers, defecate in their wounds, transmit shagas, and they get out of there before morning. And all you have is a little red welt from getting bit by something. And then you take home Chagas disease. So that's kind of like the classic transmission. And, and um, the other side note, which is interesting, you know, we talked about vertical transmission from mom to babies. This happens just like HIV in humans. Um, but the good news is the transmission rate is around 5%. So if mom is infected, human mom is infected, baby only has a 5% chance of getting it. Thank God, because that would be, that'd be a really tough deal to, to have to swallow. So, so with the kissing bug biting humans, that's, that's a, like, it, it's a real thing though. Yeah. I mean, they could easily just, you know, you got kissing bugs eating, eat, you know, biting your dogs, you could have them biting you too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the, the current estimate for, you know, the number of humans in the, in the world right now that have Chagas disease is anywhere from eight to 12 million. Um, so wow. it's, it's right behind malaria in numbers, um, but much, much worse than malaria. Um, in the United States, just based on immigration alone, um, you know, not taking into account cases that are transmitted here, okay, like people with no travel history, we're up at about 350,000 um, humans in America just from immigration. So, um, and interestingly, for any West Coasters on the on the on the podcast right now, those guys uh, in LA County, um, that's the number one county for Chagas disease and immigrants. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. I, I didn't know how many immigrants they had there. I mean, we're talking millions and millions of people. And yeah. a lot of those immigrants come from Bolivia. And uh, Bolivia is the number one country in the world for Chagas disease. So, so these, obviously the kissing bug is the number one culprit. Is there, is there an, another bug? I mean, you know, because mosquitoes and air what care what everybody associates with malaria, but could could a mosquito carry it, and could could it be be flipped and flopped, or I mean, how does yeah. that work? Yeah, just just the kissing bug is the only you know I guess suitable vector, so the only one that can kind of complete that life cycle, if that okay. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So like, I'll give you an example. Like a chicken can get. Get, get infected with these. And that's one of, I think we talked about that, Megan, at the talk, you know, it's like, well, what's the best way to prevent against this? Well, get, get you a bunch of chickens because <laughs> they eat everything, right? So the chickens, if it ate one of these kissing bugs that had Chagas disease, it would get those cysts in there, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't replicate. They wouldn't do anything. It's what we call a dead end host. So right. you get it. It's like us with heartworm disease. I mean, humans get heartworm disease. You get by mosquito, you get heartworm microflare babies injected yeah. into your body it's going to cruise around for a little bit before, before it gets killed, but it can't complete that cycle. And so that's kind of where, you know, birds and reptiles, and amphibians, they can have Chagas, but it, you know, it kind of neutralizes it. That's right. I do remember you saying that. And, you know, since chickens also eat ticks, they're, they're becoming a big uh, fan in my book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Big time. You get, you get some chickens will actually eat mice and I mean, they're, they're pretty brutal creatures when you think about it. They're, they're pretty tough yeah. characters, you know. That's why I wonder where the word chicken came from because like the derogatory yeah. term chicken. <laughs> yeah. But so if it now can a can a chicken be a carrier and can could there be a tr transference there? Like, you know, I use the no, box yeah, and the you're handles. okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, so yeah. You're you're perfectly fine. The next question, because I know you covered this in the um the session that we were at geographically, where are you seeing this? Like, you know, where do people need to be aware of this? Because um, yeah. you know, I had a veterinarian here tell me, ah, oh, we don't get that here. We don't need to worry about it. And we're in Georgia, it's warm here. 
So I figure we can get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, would you mind Megan pulling up that slide with the yeah. map on it real quick? I think that's number 13 there. Okay. Um, and that I'm glad you asked. So it's a little busy slide, but focus on the, on the right hand side of the slide, the map of the United States. And um, okay. yep, there we go. Perfect. So if you can, if you can see that, okay, the shaded areas, the yellow areas are areas that are reported to have kissing bugs living naturally in that environment. Okay. So th that doesn't mean that they're being imported. I mean, this is, you go out in California, you go out in Georgia, um, you go out in Tennessee, you can find kissing bugs. It's, they love to live there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see, I think it comes out to be like 28 states or something like that. And including Hawaii, which is crazy, but, but Hawaii apparently has a lot of palm trees. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of palm trees. That's right. That's right. Um, all those areas, you know, south of Oregon, south of Connecticut, just that la latitude line drawn there, anything south, those are going to be areas where it's what we call endemic. Okay. So when we go out there, we would expect to have some degree of Chagas in those areas. Okay. Now, remember, because of travel, and some of you guys might be up in the north, you might live in Maine, you might live in Washington, you know, you might even have a dog that you adopted from a rescue organization that came from Texas or Louisiana, you know, because of travel, either relocation because of natural events like Hurricane Katrina was a mass exodus of shelter dogs to the north to get adopted. Um, you know, and it's been such a good deal to get stray dogs out of these southern states up to the north because up north they want these dogs. And I think that's awesome. But we're transmitting and, and transporting this disease unknowingly. Mm -hmm. You know, number one, we've got it and these dogs have it, but number two, we're transporting them without testing them. <laughs> and so, you know, it's really kind of like the perfect storm. So even if you don't live in these areas, like, you know, in Georgia or Florida, you know, even if you're up in Maine, just as a veterinarian, we, we always encourage our medical staff to know about this disease and know because you might be treating a dog that came from the South and you're going to need to have that on your list of possibilities if the dog becomes sick or heaven forbid something terrible happens like death, like with, with Chagas because it's so common. And so while we're on this slide, I'll kind of just, just briefly show just the numbers real quick. Um, what I've done is in the red, everybody's familiar with heartworm disease. So the vector is the mosquito and heartworm disease is a tiny little parasite that goes into the heart. It's all it does. And it causes a lot of problems there. Okay. We have preventions for it. And so in those areas that have mosquitoes, you guys do either a monthly prevention or you get an injection once a year and that helps to prevent heartworm disease. Okay. So in the red on each state that's listed here is confirmed data that we have on prevalence of heartworm disease. How many, what percent of the population has heartworm disease, okay? And I put that there because everybody's comfortable with heartworm. We wanna be able to compare, compare it in context, okay? So just for instance, we'll just start from the top. Louisiana is number one in the country for heartworm disease. 7.1% positive, okay? And that'll fluctuate, but let's just say around 7%. When we look at Chagas disease in the same exact population of dogs in Louisiana, we find that 22% of those dogs have Chagas disease. Okay, that, that just puts it in perspective here, okay? You know, everybody's battling heartworms, we're all aware of it, but we're missing the elephant room, okay? 22%, one fifth of the dogs are carrying Chagas disease, okay? And then we go down to our great state of Texas, you know, we've got a ton of data on how much heartworm and how much Chagas disease is in our state. You know, we're running at about 3% heartworm, okay? In dogs that are in shelter situations, that number is actually 16%, okay? So I want to be transparent here, and we're going to compare apples to apples, but in shelter populations, you know, they haven't been given heartworm prevention, right? They're, they're off the street. They're just being exposed. So they're running at about 16%. That's a lot of dogs. But when we look at those same exact dogs for Chagas, we find that 18% of those guys have Chagas disease, okay? Mm. You know, 8% of our 8% of our military dogs have it. 13% of our companion animals have it, at least in the Southern Texas region. So, you know, we're, we're knocking it out of the park with this infectious disease thing down here. Okay. Yeah. And it just goes to show you, you know, we, you know, we have this disease, but because we're not looking for it routinely, we're missing a lot of things. So, you know, I would encourage you guys, if you are concerned about Chagas disease in your pet, let's say they came from the South, or let's say you spend the winter in Florida. Okay. 
you know, you might just want to mention to your vet, hey, listen, I travel frequently with my dog to areas that are known to have Chagas disease. I would like to go ahead and have my dog tested for that. I think that's really, really fair. And how complicated is the test? Is it like the heartworm test or is it a little more involved? Yeah, that's, it's exactly like the heartworm test. So we draw a little bit of blood and we take the serum, okay, which is just a part of the blood and we test that for antibody. Okay. So it's a little, it deviates a little bit from the heartworm because we're actually looking for pieces of the worm. We call that an antigen test, but with Chagas disease, we're actually checking the blood for antibodies. So what that means, what that translates to is a very, very accurate test um, that you're, you're not going to miss too many of them whenever you check for antibody. And could, could people get this test? Do vets know where to, I mean, is it like, oh yeah, we'll just you know, get the Chagas test or do they need to wear specific? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you ask your veterinarian, you know, about testing for Chagas disease, they should be able to, um, to kind of find out where that is definitely in the Southern regions. And, and again, for those of you that uh, spend a lot of time on interstate 10, um, that corridor, at least in the United States is riddled, riddled with Chagas disease, North and South. Well, probably south like 4,000 miles <laughs> so all the way down to the <laughs> yeah. South Pole. But, uh, but north, north, you're going to go up at, you know, at least, you know, seven, 800 miles where you're getting really like dense areas of Chagas disease. Mm -hmm. So veterinarians in those areas probably are familiar with it, but just in case they're not, that way you can, you know, help your vet out a little bit would be to um, ask for a Trypanosoma cruzi, or we call it T. cruzi. That's the name for Chagas, the Chagas parasite itself. T. cruzi, IFA, okay, IFA, and that stands for indirect fluorescent antibody test. Okay, IFA. It's just an antibody test. Okay, um, but if you ask your vet for that Chagas or T. cruzi IFA, that'll that'll get them on the right track. Okay, all of our commercial labs will. Um, have access to that. And most every test, at least right now in 2022, is run through Texas A&M at our state laboratory there. Okay. So if you're in Maine and you use your commercial lab, they're going to ship it right to Texas. Okay. Okay. Great. And did you have a question? Yeah. So I was noticing the geography, uh, for instance, it was hashed out, which was West Virginia. So I'm assuming that cold cold weather is what's keeping this the natural um kissing bug from reproducing there or it's not a it's not a very uh ha a habitat that they're they're going to do well in is that am i guessing right is that okay well it's cold they don't reproduce here or they they're not naturally you mean in West Virginia specifically well no no just the geography it oh. kind of stopped it was Oregon Idaho Wyoming, South Dakota, all the way across. And then like I knew, I saw New York was not there, but New Jersey was potential. So is that kind of what we're talking about? So the warmer clients, it's more conducive to have the kissing bug. So as you get further away from, we'll say the equator, one way or the other, your, your chances go down. Is that what, would that be a good way to say it? Yeah, that, that's, very, that's a very good way to say it. So the, the kissing bugs can't really survive that well in those environments. And, you know, West Virginia has plenty of wildlife, you know, plenty of food sources. But like you said, you know, the six feet of snow in the winter, you know, pretty much deter from that. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, again, this is regional, too. So, you know, like Tennessee you know, in the Smoky Mountains, when it's really, really cold and frozen, may not have it as much as the lower lands, you know, like in Nashville or Memphis. So it's, you know, it, these are just blanket statements. But like one interesting thing to me was like California, um, if you look at that data right there, um, I you know, they, <laughs> I was gonna yeah, say. They, like they didn't, they didn't look at San Diego <laughs> or yeah. LA, which is just right. Right. I 10 dead ends. Right. In yeah. LA. Right. Yeah. So you would, they went all the way North to San Francisco. It's cold up there, but yeah, they not only tested San Francisco shelter dogs, they, they went downtown and tested them. that, that blew me away. And then when they went out to Marin County, you know, like in the suburbs, right. Then, then the numbers shot through the roof. Right. So within state, you know, you're going to have hotbeds of kissing bugs and things like you said, but I, you know, I guess in West Virginia, they, they just don't, 
you know, they just don't have very many bugs, if it any, if any, you know. Yeah. Or maybe so, but yeah, the further north, data. right? Well, right, and that's a possibility too. Like we we have, um, like even within Texas, just to give you an example, you know, where we are, and like Austin, San Antonio, Houston, we're we're riddled with it. But you go west to the arid West Texas desert, El Paso. You, you have a, a big decline in Chagas disease. You go up north, even to Dallas and Fort Worth areas, you have a decline, okay, versus these areas that are a little bit more, you know, tropical in the sense mm-hmm. of humidity and heat and things like that. Yeah. Exactly what I was going to say when you described that, because, yeah, that, that humidity. Now, uh, we did want to take a look at slide number seven as well, just so people yeah. can identify. Because when when I got home from that conference, I was looking them up because we have stink bugs as well. And I was like, are those what I'm thinking of? So- <laughs> yeah, yeah, they look very, very similar, but they are they are a little bit different. I think it's the head is a little bit yeah. different. Yeah, that that. head is is kind of a good way to tell uh, which, you know, if you have a a stink bug or a kissing bug, and there's these other ones called assassin bugs, and -hmm. assassin bugs um, do not carry Chagas disease, and they actually kill the kissing bug, so we definitely don't want to kill those guys. Yeah, but, um, and and you can see these are, uh, so that squatty thing, (laughs) the fat one on the left, Mm -hmm. that one is uh, is actually a nymph, so a baby, so they're they're like ticks, you know, they don't really have eggs, they're more like you know, different stages of babies, but, um, the three on the right are three different species that we have the most commonly in Texas. Okay. But they still have some resemblance to each other. You know yeah. what I mean? Sorry, um, they look the, similar. Yeah. And then if you go down to slide eight, um, there's a link there. Um, that is a free identification guide that, um, we have a Chagas task force, a bunch of great folks on that. Um, and we all kind of came together and, and put this out to help people identify these kissing bugs. Okay. So, um, I actually still use this. Okay. If somebody brings me a really weird bug, I'm not an entomologist. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. study bugs, but mm-hmm. it does help you kind of navigate. Do I need to be worried about this? You know, yeah, no, yeah. that's that great. Kind of that's, um, I, I think I'll be referencing that because, and I'm sure a lot of our yeah. listeners and viewers will too. Um, so tell us about the, um, the symptoms. Now I know you've got acute Chagas and chronic Chagas, so tell us, you know, if, you know, potentially we have no idea if our dog got bit by a kissing bug, but what are some things that our dogs might be suffering from that could be related? Yeah. And that's, that's really a good tool to have in your box to, to know, you know, what I need to look about, look for, do I need to be worried about Chagas disease every day? No, please don't do that. <laughs> but, you know, if you can kind of get a very basic understanding of the disease, it'll, it'll kind of give you some clues on, on what we look for as veterinarians. Okay. So just a very brief recap on the clinical signs of, of Chagas disease. In our minds, we divide it up into two distinct phases. Okay. There's the acute phase and the chronic phase, okay? The acute phase is associated with newly seeing this organism in my body, okay? So I I got bit three weeks ago or I I ate a bug two or three weeks ago. Now my body's seen it for the first time. It's freaking out, okay? You're talking major, major inflammation. It's like right after you sprained your ankle for the next few days, okay? It's, It's everything's red and swollen. Just think about it that way, okay? Things are going haywire. The body's freaking out. You have a sick dog most of the time, okay? And there's a lot of variables in that, like how sick is my dog going to be? And, you know, how quickly are they going to get over it? But for the most part, you know, these guys are, are sick. Okay. If they survive the acute phase and they, they go into a phase called the chronic phase, chronic just means greater than eight weeks. Okay. So that kind of in your mind, you can see, you know, less than eight weeks, acute, greater than eight weeks, chronic. Okay. The chronic phase, the body's getting used to it. It's, it's winning the battle. It's putting it into remission. It's walling it off. It's sequestering and isolating. Okay. So one of the areas that the body loves to isolate or contain Chagas disease is in cardiac tissue. So in the heart, we had talked about that. We saw it in that picture, okay? So what, what that means is that the organism is very slowly replicating, okay? It's actually flying under the radar of the body's immune system, and it's secretly replicating, okay? And it's, you know, you're throwing out, you're, you're busting a few cells a day, okay? Nothing to really upset anybody about. And so most of the cases that we see with Chagas disease are in the asymptomatic phase, okay, which means it's flying under the radar. We can't really detect any disease. You can't show me a hundred dogs that have chronic Chagas disease and say, can you tell me which one of these has Chagas? Okay. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell unless I have a test. Okay. It's that quiet. 
but what's happening behind the scenes is that as it's slowly replicating and continuously replicating, it's causing scar tissue to build up in whatever organ that it's doing in. So just for purposes of this illustration, let's talk about the heart, okay? So it's causing scar tissue to build up in the heart, okay? It's progressive, which means it's continuing on in a negative path, right? Over time, we're gonna build up enough scar tissue to where we have some serious problems. And then this really, really interesting thing that Chagas does is it generates arrhythmias, okay? Arrhythmias are strictly their abnormal heart rhythms, okay? So instead of, you know, love dub, love dub, like a pulse, like your heart contracting, okay? It can, it's very erratic, okay? And it, and it's not in sync. There's no cadence. It's, it's, it's chaos. And there's different arrhythmias, you know, some arrhythmias are like, well, that's nice. That's interesting. But others are like, oh my gosh, we're about to die. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Chagas does is it is just crazy. It uses the body's immune response. So antibody production. So when, when your body sees Chagas, it makes antibodies to kill it. Okay. Just like let's use COVID. It sees COVID, it makes antibodies to kill it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those antibodies, while they are helpful in Chagas disease, they actually can cause an arrhythmia. Okay. Mm. They bind to the heart receptors and mm. they can cause it to misfire. Ugh. Now, why is that bad? Well, the longer I have Chagas disease, the more chance I have of having an arrhythmia mm. and some of the arrhythmias. In fact, the number one symptom with Chagas disease is acute death. Okay. You have a normal dog, you kiss them goodnight, you go to bed and you wake up and you have a dead dog. Okay. Mm. I, I have, I have countless stories of, of, of that exact situation happening, okay? Or a dog's running, just boom, drops dead, okay? So that, that right there is why Chagas is 10 times worse than heartworm disease because with heartworm disease, it's predictable. It's gonna be a very slow road, okay? Your dog's not gonna suddenly die from heartworm disease, okay? You're gonna have years before, even in Louisiana, <laughs> you're gonna have years <laughs> before you, you have to come to grips with, okay, this heart is failing, okay? And you would, so, in, in saying that you with heartworm, if you're going and getting your yearly test, you would detect it before it got out of control 100%. and then you can treat it. You know, I'm assuming the shelter dogs that have it and the reason the 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 care is so difficult is because it's full blown heartworm. It's been growing for a long time versus if your dog happened to get it and you are keeping up with your tests, you're going to identify it quickly. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You're not going to be surprised. You know, when you, when you go, if you go to the vet every year or so, Mm -hmm. And you kind of give your heartworm prevention. <laughs> okay, like <laughs> we did, there's a survey that's out. This is from years ago. Like how? What's the average number of heartworm prevention doses that the average owner gives? Well, it's it's eight in a year. So, you know, you're missing four months, which isn't that bad here. But mm -hmm. in Louisiana, I mean, you can get bit really quick. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so but you're not going to be surprised, you know. And the average heartworm parasite load is seven to eight worms in a dog that you're not going to have any clinical symptoms for years with that. Okay. So you've got some time. So we're keeping on, we're keeping on track with that. So, you know, if we've got a dog that has chronic Chagas disease, literally at any given point, you know, we could have a mess on our hands. And the real big concern for us as veterinarians, you know, let's say you're doing your job, you're, you go to the vet every year. We're not screening for it on an annual basis, but we say, Hey, you know, Megan, your dog, has really bad dental disease. We need to go ahead and do a dental cleaning. Okay, sure. You schedule that, see in two weeks, you come in. I anesthetize your dog, not knowing that it has Chagas disease. Even if you, you were trying to be diligent and do a good job and we did preoperative blood work, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I may not get any red flags from that, okay? And then your dog's under anesthesia and I'm watching my EKG and I have one of those arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. I, I could be in, in, in deep doo-doo at that point. Okay. Because your dog could have a heart attack under the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just from a routine dental cleaning. Wow. So, you know, with, with, with the numbers of asymptomatic dogs, meaning that I can't detect any disease in your dog with just doing a physical exam, mm -hmm. Because of that reason, you know, we, we strongly encourage you guys as owners to, to ask your vet to get tested. If you're in one of those regions, if you've seen the kissing bug, it's not going to hurt to test. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's an, it's an ounce of prevention. That's really worth it. Okay. Yeah. So to kind of get back on that, you know, what, what does the disease look like in dogs in general, heart disease is number one. Okay. So you know, as dogs get older, they get heart disease. So that might be something that as veterinarians, we're comfortable with saying, hey, look, you know, you have a poodle that's 14 years old. 
we expect that dog to get heart disease because of genetics. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I might be less willing to test for Chagas disease if it fits that mold, but I need to be, I need to be thorough and check for that. Okay. So heart disease is number one. Um, number two, which is a little, little vague, um, would, would be lymph node enlargement, um, organ enlargement. Okay. So like you notice a swelling in your dog's uh, neck or something, or you notice a swelling on your dog's uh, foot, Uh, you know, those type of things, we call that edema. Um, Those kind of nonspecific signs are really big indicators that, Hey, you just got bit by one of those bugs. Okay. It causes focal inflammation in there. Um, Another one that's real common that we see as part of a routine blood screen is protein in the urine. We call it proteinuria. Okay. So your dog is peeing out protein. Now you can't like look at your dog's urine and see protein. Okay. We have to have to do a test for that, but that's one of those screeners that we will commonly pick up Chagas on. So you come in, you know, maybe we have a little bit of weight loss. We're, we're kind of, eh, you know, we're, we're just sleeping more, something like that. Well, if we do a, a blood test with urine, we're going to see that protein and that's going to key us in on a whole bunch of diseases, including Chagas disease. So, you know, I think for, for, you know, just being a dog owner, the, big take home is, you know, watch for any signs of, of being tired, lethargy, um, or any heart disease. Okay. That would be a huge red flag to tell your vet about Chagas. Okay. What, um, okay. I guess I'm going to ask the question, what are the prevent preventative measures you can do? Um, you know, both. And, and can you treat Chagas? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, to speak to prevention, um, you know, there isn't, like a heartworm prevention. There's not like a monthly pill that you can give your dog or a yearly injection or anything like that. That's going to be effective at preventing it. But what you can do is you can really focus in on the vector. Okay. So we've got a lot of good products that kill kissing bugs. All right. So one of them is to treat your environment. So that's one approach. And that's what they really hammer down on. Like in Bolivia, for instance, you know, again, the number one country for Chagas disease in humans in Bolivia, they spray, um, you know, dwelling. So your home, um, yards where your dog might be, if you have a bunch of dogs and they live in a kennel, you definitely want to be able to treat those. And, um, the class of, of drug or spray that we use is called permethrins. Okay. And permethrins have been around forever. They kill fleas, they kill ticks, scorpions down here in Texas. Okay. They kill a lot of different vectors. Okay. But they're really good at killing, uh, kissing bugs. Okay. And the specific one that, that gets all the press uh, for kissing bug killing is called cypermethrin. Um, and that cypermethrin, the trade name is demon spray. And you can get that at your you know, home depot, Lowe's tractor supply, but that cypermethrin is very, very effective at killing these vectors. Okay. Um, on a dog side and a cat side. So what can I give my pet to help prevent or to help protect against these kissing bugs? Um, we have a class of drugs called isoxazolines, and these are all of our new oral medications that we use for flea and tick. So some of them that you might be familiar with would be Brevecto, Nexgard, Semperica, Cordelio. There's a, there's a bunch of them. Like every drug company has one. Okay. But those are marketed for flea and tick prevention, but they actually will kill the kissing bug as well. So you can drastically reduce the number of kissing bugs in your environment by using those products, spraying your environment. But remember, the number one transmission in dogs is oral ingestion of these bugs. So, you know, these bugs can fly over your cypermethrin spray. Okay, Mm -hmm. they can. um, If your dog eats one before the Brevecto kills it by taking a blood meal, you know, you know, we we kind of. It's not going to help that way, but over time, we have noticed that those families that spray and do these isoxazolines really do have a dramatically reduced number of kissing bugs in the environment. Okay. So, so yeah, then the treatment, you know, if, if that kissing bug gets past the barriers (laughs) that you try to put up, (laughs) what, what, and, and hopefully you're testing yearly so that you can stay on top of it. What would be, are, are there any treatments? Right. That, so we do have, uh, we've been, well, let me back up on testing real quick. Um, you know, we're currently working on a test that is going to be readily available to veterinarians, 15 minute tests run in house and paired with a heartworm test. Okay. So that's coming down the pipeline that I think we think that's going to be a game changer. Okay. Because like we were drawing a lot of similarities between heartworm disease and Chagas disease, 
we need to approach it the same way. Okay. We all determined 40 years ago when we started checking for heartworm disease that we aren't very good at telling what dogs look like with heartworm disease, same way with Chaga. So we need to be testing these dogs annually. So we're going to make it easy and affordable for everybody to do that. Okay. So that's number one. Um, if your dog or cat has Chagas disease, there is a treatment available. Now it's what we consider off label at this point. Off label means it hasn't gone through the rigors of FDA approval yet. Okay. But we are currently um, we have an investigation underway and filed with the FDA and they're looking at all the data. Okay. So hopefully God willing in the next two years, we're going to have our product ready to go. Okay. And available, but until then it's hundred percent legal for your veterinarian to prescribe these two drugs that we use to treat Chagas disease. So, um, these two drugs are very effective together, not individually, but together there's an amazing synergy that works to help eliminate the parasite over time. Okay. The downside of the treatment is that it's an extended treatment period. Okay. In the chronic phase, we talked about acute and chronic in the chronic phase, which is by far the most common phase. It takes 12 months to eliminate the organism. Okay. It wasn't my call. I, the Chagas didn't get the memo that I <laughs> to, to make a shorter treatment time. Okay? <laughs> it it is a very fastidious organism. It's tough. It's it, it's just the way around it. But up until now, there hasn't been a treatment that's been effective, and, yeah. and there's a lot of reasons for that. But we we have to we have to outlast the parasite while we're pummeling it. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. so that that's one of the downsides. Um, but if you're lucky enough, and if, if you're lucky enough to get a, a test in the acute phase, it's only a 60 day treatment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. So I'll give you a prime example of that. Let's say, um, and this, this has happened, unfortunately, commonly, um, with puppies. Okay. So mom delivers a litter of puppies uh, weeks to days after delivery, puppies start to pass and fade and die. One of the number one reasons for fading puppies or death and young pups is Chagas disease. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, wow. it ravages them. Okay. So if we can catch that soon enough, we can intervene and then we've got a 60 day treatment. We can eliminate it because the puppy's only two weeks old. Okay. It hasn't had it that long. Um, another one we've had before was the owner saw the dog eating a kissing bug. Mm -hmm. Okay. Came in right away a little too early, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it was all negative come back in three weeks when it has time to process and make antibodies positive. Okay. Treat that dog for 60 days. You're done. Okay. So you're not necessarily locked into 365 days of treatment, but you know, we kind of need to be prepared for it. The other benefit of the drugs is it's very safe. Okay. We make adjustments if the dogs have some nausea or some vomiting or, you know, inappetence, that kind of thing. But for the most part, these dogs do amazingly well with these drugs. Okay. And they're very affordable, um, which is nice as well. So uh, we haven't seen, you know, knock on wood, we haven't seen any resistance to these drugs with any of the dogs that we've treated and we've treated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dogs successfully. Okay. So there is hope. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't want you to just be like, oh, well, you know, there's nothing's available to us. We just have to watch our dog die. Mm. Um, and these dogs are pretty resilient. You know, they're pretty tough dogs and um, it's pretty amazing. Some of the dogs that we've had come in, you know, some of them have Chagas disease and heartworm and hookworms and, 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 you know, wow. and, and they, they're just like, Hey, you know, we're tough. So uh, they, they can pull through it. You know, am I correct in understanding when you said they all go through the acute phase and then if they survive it, they're in chronic. So if you yep. have a very, okay. So if you have a very sick dog at the get go, you definitely want to get the Chagas test. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Because you want it, you want to catch it in that acute phase. And, you know, I talked about those variables that kind of help decide if your dog is going to live or how bad the disease is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the, one of the big variables that we've noticed is dogs less than a year old, if they're exposed to Chagas disease, have a rough go. Okay. It's about 50, 50, if they're going to make it. Okay. I mean, those guys are usually really sick. Now, if your dog is two or three, um, four or five, even later, and it gets exposed to Chagas disease, you may not even, in that acute phase, you may well have a little bit of diarrhea for a day. Eh, that's it. Okay. Or maybe two or three days, maybe moping around a little bit and then the dog's fine. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have an immune system for a reason and dogs do too, and it does its job most of the time. But like in young dogs, they have a very naive immune system. Sometimes they respond too exuberantly and they'll, they'll take themselves out sometimes, you know, some of the worst cases of Chagas in the acute phase are young dogs. And, and by young dogs, I mean, six to nine months. I mean, it, they struggle, their heart really does go, go haywire. 
And um, I think I remember you saying in the presentation that it is reversible. So whatever, is that correct? Like whatever damage was done, can the, does the body repair itself? Yeah. So one of the other benefits of treatment, okay, using these two drugs that we have, um, not only do we eliminate the parasite, but we can also remodel the heart back to what it was. Okay. It's incredible how this works. Okay. So we talked about scar tissue. So when that cell pops and releases all the babies, it kills that cell and then it gets replaced with scar tissue and fat. Okay. That's just how the heart heals. If you get a lot of that, you're going to have a bunch of scar tissue. Okay. Obviously you can't turn scar tissue back to heart tissue. Okay. So that's permanent damage. That's not going to, you know, we can't reverse that, but in dogs, let's say they just have 10% scar tissue, 20%. Okay. That's not going to impact them long-term. Okay. Mm -hmm. But their heart can be very, when they get infected, their heart gets very, very inflamed and the cells, instead of being a nice straight line like this, mm -hmm. they start to cross like that and, and they can't really contract. So then the heart fails. Okay. And that's what we see. So you can have a dog that has heart failure because of Chagas disease. And if you do the treatment, over time, what happens is those cells start to straighten out again, okay? okay. And the, the muscle fibers literally remodel themselves and go back to feeding normally, okay? That doesn't happen with any other heart disease. Not even, we call myocarditis. That's, that's what Chagas causes is myocarditis. So even myocarditis from other diseases, we, we, can't, we can't ever fix that, okay? That's a permanent deal. We're done, okay? Right. So that's the benefit of doing treatment. So even though your dog might be laid out in ICU for seven days, oxygen, heart meds, fluids, drugs, IV, and you're like, man, this heart, it's toast. We've got arrhythmias. That dog can still pull through it and have a very normal life if we can eliminate that parasite and help restructure that heart. Okay. So that's the really cool, exciting thing for us as veterinarians with this treatment is because even though things look terrible, we still have hope that we can pull them through this and, and get them back to normal. Yeah. Wow. That, I mean, that's, and I want to make sure I heard that right. So you're kind of reversing myocarditis. Is that, is that what I'm yeah. hearing? I'm sitting here. That's going, exactly right. Hmm, can yeah, yeah. That in well, humans, because we're seeing know, an right? increase in that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's. I don't think you can do it in humans, and that's what. Yeah, that's what's but incredible. Have we tried? <laughs> yeah, but have we tried? Yeah. When it comes to Chagas, we we don't know. We haven't tried this in in humans yeah. yet. Okay, yeah. Yet, but we but we do know in dogs. Yeah, with myocarditis, not only can we eliminate the cause of the myocarditis, that's the parasite. Mm -hmm. Not only can we eliminate the myocarditis itself, which is truly inflammation. Yep. We can eliminate that, but we can also eliminate all those changes that happen during myocarditis. So you're getting this threefer. Okay. And, yeah. and again, the trick, you know, and again, I don't, you know, I don't want to just sugarcoat this whole thing, but the trick is, can I keep my patient? Can I keep your dog alive long enough for all those great changes to yeah, happen? Okay? Yeah. Right. You know, that's, we can only go so fast, but yes. if the body's working with us and we're doing it, we're giving a drug that's designed to do that very thing. Heck yeah. We can have a dog that can go hunt the field again. We can go, we can have a dog that can go reproduce and continue breeding. You know, I mean, this disease is devastating for breeders. Okay. I mean, we're talking about shutting down kennels, we're talking about some fantastic kennels uh, in Texas that have been impacted negatively with Chagas to where, you know, they're like, hey, doc, I'm going to have to shut down. I'm going to lose my livelihood. I've got bloodlines, you know, 10 generations deep that are these fantastic field trial dogs. I mean, these are these are some studs. And, you know, we, we didn't even talk about the implications that this has for the United States military. I mean, yeah. military working dogs, um, you know, that's this one of the biggest uh group of, you know, housed animals in the entire world. You're talking tens of thousands of dogs around the world that belong to the United States military. You know, whether that be Border Patrol, uh, you know, TSA dogs, mm -hmm. um, you know, truly, you know, Army, Army yeah. dogs. We, we interviewed you know, our I, nephew who had, had has, has a retired and he worked with him. And when that statistic came up, I was thinking about that, you know, because they I remember David telling us, you know, that they told him how much that dog was worth, you know, if yep. he were to put its life in danger, you know, cause he had to go through all the processes and it's a lot of money that they put into that training. So they, yeah. they would be smart to test for shock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and yeah. it's our taxpayer it, money. So maybe we should. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Right. And, and, a, and, a, and a plug to them, you know, they do test every single dog for Chagas disease that oh, comes great. through the program. So you're thousands and thousands of dogs each year. And that's, and that's why they find so many cases uh, of Chagas disease okay. there. And they are, you know, 
and, and they're committed to doing the best medicine for them and treating them with these drugs, you know, which is great. That is great. Um, but, you know, the, the impact that this disease has, um, you know, is, is substantial. And we've only scratched the surface, you know, once we get everybody on board and, you know, we're testing and we're testing every dog every year and we, we can really get a feel for, for how many are out there. Now, the estimates based on FDA and the, the numbers that they've crunched based on the data from everybody. Okay, this is not my data. This is their data. Uh, you know, we're looking at two to three million dogs in the United States alone at any given year that have Chagas disease. Wow. And I will tell you just firsthand, um, you know, we're di diagnosing in the thousands. That's it. Okay. We are, <laughs> we are, we are missing wow. the boat big time. Yeah. So, you know, that's why we want to increase uh, awareness of the disease. So, you know, you guys can drive that, you know, please, your vet, please just, just humor me test. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say what negative. Great. We'll have a party. Yeah. Are you are are you seeing any breeds that are more or less susceptible to this? Are are there breeds that are adapting? You know, over time, parasites uh, they either have to change as our body changes and adapts. You know, uh, that's why you can get rid of colds and things of that nature. Are you starting to see that in in any of the breeds or any of the breeds, maybe the older breeds that have been around? Because I'm assuming that this. Chagas disease has been around for a while. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, older breeds might, I don't know. I'm just asking that question. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's good. I, I, I there aren't really any breeds that like adapt to it. Like, you know, I'm used to getting Chagas. I'm going to fight it off quicker, which would be awesome. I would want one of those dogs for sure. <laughs> so I don't yeah. get, so I don't get my heart broken. You know, you're like, Oh man. But um, te so Texas A&M, our, our veterinary school, came out with a great paper last year, and it looked at what we call breed dis distribution. So, you know, what breeds are more likely to get Chagas disease that, you know, come to, come to our veterinary hospital? Um, so do, do you guys want to take a guess what the number one breed was? Well, I was sitting here thinking maybe Chihuahuas are less likely to get it because they're from a Southern, you know, warm area and they've adapted. But I, I mean, golden retrievers? I I, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the number one breed and you know, all your TikTok subscribers are going to be crushed when I tell them this, but it's the French bulldog. Oh no. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they, so A&M had found that 54% of those dogs uh, of the Frenchies that came in had Chagas disease 54. I mean, wow. that, that's, that's, that's insane. That's, okay. Yeah, my, my question with that is, cause yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a, and I'm sure you are too, but I'm a big opponent of um, puppy mills. <laughs> and yeah. I know that the popular breeds tend to be, you know, they're, they don't, they're not as healthy because they're overbred because people are trying to make money. Do you think that's why that it's a combination that, you know, p potentially the breeding, like it's not a healthy animal to begin with because they're so popular and they're being overbred, or do you just think it's the luck of the draw for the Frenchie. Yeah. Well, I think there's two things, you know, one is, you know, you're kind of alluding to it like hybrid vigor and you guys might've heard of hybrid vigor before. So hybrid vigor is the, the premise is that the more variability in genetics, the tougher I'm going to be. Okay. So when we have that Heinz 57 or that mixed breed dog, they're going to be tougher. And I think as in general veterinarians agree, you know, when you get a mixed breed dog, they're usually more hardy than a purebred. Okay. So there may be some of that involved in that. Okay. But on the flip side, um, you know, some of the hardiest dogs that I've seen with Chagas disease happen to be the pit bull. So the American Staffordshire Terrier. I mean, those guys coming out of Louisiana, I mean, you know, they're born with some skull in this lip and a cigarette hanging out of this one, man. They are <laughs> tough. Uh, you, you can't kill them if you tried. They, they are tough. And right. um, so, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's that flip side. But there might be, we know that there is what we call, you know, host interactions or genetics, basically, that define how my immune system is going to work. Okay. Because of who I am. Mm -hmm. And when you start, you know, line breeding and getting this purebred and this purebred, mm -hmm. you're limiting that response. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's possible. Okay. But the other thing I think is that, you know, if I drop $3,000 on a French bulldog, I'm probably going to bring it to the vet if it gets sick. That's mm -hmm. the other part of it. Right. So those dogs are probably more likely to go to the vet and we're going to test for it, I guess is, is, is another so thing too. Yeah. So what I'm hearing there is you're saying that the, maybe the reason why the French bulldog is got such high numbers is because people are actually testing for this. So it could yeah. be another breed has a mixed breed. We'll just say a mixed a, a doodle 
maybe they have 55 percent you know but we're not maybe taking that dog to the vet like we are Afraid. yeah yeah okay. and, and the doodles are you know the doodles are expensive too but i think you know more so than like a dog that i adopt for a hundred dollars from the shelter yes. you know i'm i'm, I'm probably going to go to that i'm not nothing against that i mean i love shelter dogs i think it's awesome but i'm just saying that by the time you invest that much money in a dog you're man you're going every year <laughs> you know you're not yeah. missing yeah so and, and you know the other interesting thing was too like the second breed so like you've got frenchies way up here at the 54 percent, and then down here at 30 percent. i mean it's a pretty big drop it's like yeah. almost half you you got the german shepherd okay and then megan to speak to you you know what number three was was the chihuahua <laughs> so, oh, so oh, wow. it doesn't yeah. help that it was you know formulated in a warm environment <laughs> yeah 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 I, so. I, I was actually going to go the other way i was going to say well it's it's got to be like a bird dog or it's got to be a game a game hunting dog because they're, they're usually in outdoor kennels yeah that's right. a good would, point you would think oh, okay well the this the Springer Spaniel or, or one of these types of dogs would, would be leading the pack. I wouldn't think Frenchie. Like if you'd asked right, me that, I, right. I would have got that wrong a hundred times. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I would have too. I would have failed that test. I mean, you <laughs> yeah. know, and, and Frenchies, you know, have you seen their mouths? Like how do they eat anything? Yeah. You know, they're just these shovel mouths, you know? Yeah. And they, right. But yeah, they, they do. I mean, I, and they're always, you know, getting into things and rooting around. So, um, and I would have thought hunting dogs would have been pretty high up on the list too, but they didn't even make the top three, you know? That's crazy. Um, now, now when you, I guess along those same questions are, so we talked about other breeds, breeds that have more, uh, susceptibility to it. I, we're we're going to say the Frenchie. Are there breeds that are more hardy once you figure out, okay, well, we'll say the German Shepherd. Well, the German Shepherd got it, but man, it their, really their well. percentage of, of success is like, you know, 70% where the Frenchies yeah. is like 40%. Are you seeing that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, and again, going back to the pit bull, I think if, if you made me have a breed and I'm like, I wanted to show off to you and say, look how good my drug works. I do all pit bulls. Um, I think, I think they're hardier, you know, um, but I got to speak to the Belgian Malinois too, you know, the military's favorite dog. I mean, those guys, right. holy moly, you know, I, so the, I've only had one dog and well, we've been studying the disease for 18 years. I've had one dog that cured on its own the acute phase. Okay. Wow. And that was a Belgian that I knew of. Okay. That was a Belgian Malinois he came in with a tighter, positive, sick. Um, you know, we were waiting on the test to come back. Um, came back positive by the time the owner came back in for a recheck a few weeks later, um, the dog was doing fantastic. And she just insisted, just please just retest, retest the dog, retest the dog. So I retested the dog. It was negative. And I was like, what? Wow. And it wasn't like a week positive the first time it was off the charts positive. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow. I mean, just respect, you know, all, all the way. So I think, you know, if I had to pick the top two, those would be my top two dogs for sure. Um, dogs that typically do poorly during treatment, um, yeah. again, because of genetics, um, hands down the Great Pyrenees. Um, they, they um, we, we have a saying in veterinary medicine, you know, white footed dogs or white dogs. Um, you know, we need to be careful with um, drugs in general, but especially ivermectin. Um, and that's what we use for heartworm prevention. Back in the day before we had fancy drugs to treat mange, and um, we used ivermectin a lot for mange, okay? It's the only thing that we had available. Well, it's a pretty high dose, okay? And so those white-footed dogs or dogs that have white in their coat, um, they typically did poorly. They had side effects, you know, neurological symptoms, all this stuff. So that translates over to this set of drugs that we use as well. And the re we understand why now, 20 years later, why that is. It's they're, they're missing an enzyme system or they have a defective gene that doesn't code for that. So um, you know, without getting boring, it's, it's basically those dogs that are white or like great Pyrenees, they've got different enzyme systems that metabolize drugs. So whenever I give a drug to that dog, it's going to shoot through the roof. The dog can't process it very well. And so I need to be aware of that. So anybody who's listening, who has a great Pyrenees, if mm -hmm. we never test positive or shock, just tell your, tell your doc, Hey, listen, you know, they had mentioned to use a much lower dose. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and I find that, I mean, every Pyrenees I've treated, is on a toy poodle dose and I'm not lying. I mean, wow. I've got a hundred pound Pyrenees and I'm treating it with a 10 pound dose. Okay. Wow. It's just, wow. it's just how it is. Does yeah. the same go so, for border collies? Cause I, when we took yes. our new guy to the vet, she said that, um, you know, well, he doesn't look like he has any border collie in him and ivermectin, you know, is something that they're sensitive to. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and there's a border collies, shelties, collies, you know, that, that kind of line. 
Um, there is a test you can do and um, a little shameless plug for EmbarkVet.com, the, the saliva test. They have this breed health kit. Oh, it is incredible. You get over 200 tests for like $150. It's, I test my own dogs with it, okay, other than running it at the hospital. Okay, you just get right. so much more. But the test is called the MDR. Um, so uh, Mary Delta Radar, MDR1 and 2 gene. Okay, so MDR gene. And that's one of the things they test for. So if your dog comes back with one or both that are, you know, defective, um, you know that you're in that class of dogs. It's going to be sensitive to a bunch of different drugs. And that's important. That's important to know. Very. Yeah, that's very that's good very to know. And I was just thinking that I do want to get him tested, even though he looks like Dachshund and, you know, some sort of terrier. You just never know. There's, you know, there's a white stripe down his chest and, you know, he's got some little white furs underneath the dark furs. So it would be good to you know, it's always good to know. So whoever out there has a dog that you're not sure what it is, that would be a smart test to take. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would have never guessed the great Pyrenees would yeah. have, have an issue, but you know, well, th I mean, th we've already taken up so much of your time and yeah. I know like I personally could talk hours about this because I know <laughs> there's so much more we could discuss. Um, Does I know you brought up at the conference that you did ask when we were all being told not to, feed grain free because of heart issues. It was like, Hmm, have you ever thought maybe it's Chagas and it's not the, the food. So yeah, there's, and that was so funny because that ran through my head before you've, I was going to raise my hand and then you said it and I was like, wow. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many elements that we now start to think about when we, you know, think about the heart and other inflammation and, and things like that. But this, did you enjoy this? Cause this I, is your first yeah, experience. Cause, well, I, yeah, of course I geek out on these things. So <laughs> I, I love it. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's phenomenal. Um, well, hopefully I wasn't too boring with that, but I, you know, and to speak Megan to that whole grain free thing, you know, if, if anybody that's listening has a dog that has heart disease, whether it's from, you know, lentils, <laughs> okay. Or, you know, the, the vet said it was genetics or whatever, just just, I just encourage you just to dig a little bit deeper, do the Chagas test. Okay. Even if it's negative, great. We can take that off the table and you can rest easy, but yeah. if it's positive, it's going to be a game changer for you. Okay. There's no harm in looking. And you know, just the final thing I want you guys to know, just from a, a statistical standpoint, because this just hits home for me every year, a dog is alive in an area that has Chagas disease every single year, it's chances of getting Chagas disease goes up two and a half percent. Okay. So do the math on that. If I've got a 10 year old dog, even if it's healthy, my dog has a 25% chance of carrying Chagas at this very moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those are real numbers. And that was actually out of Louisiana a few years ago when they actually put the math to it. I mean, it's, it's insane how high your risk is the older you are. So even if you're a 14 year old dog and you get heart disease, don't stop there. Just run the blood test. Okay. Cause mm -hmm. it can make, it can be a game changer. That's awesome. And I know the, the title of your presentation was Chagas disease, the heartworm of the 21st century. And I think we need to start looking at it that way. And I also did want to mention it can affect other, it prefers the heart tissue, but it can affect other organs, organs. and tissue. Right. So. Yeah. If yeah. So br brain, you know, uh, brain disease, for some reason we, we have a lot I just had a cat a month ago that we diagnosed as seizures, about a nine month old kitten with seizures, Chagas positive. Um, we had a, a lemur that we treated for a year and he's doing fantastic now, about a year and a half, two, about two years ago, he was diagnosed seizures, Chagas disease in the brain. So we, you know, it doesn't just stop with the heart. Okay. I'm just trying to keep it easy for everybody right now, but um, Chagas, you could probably put it on the list for most things. Okay. So wow. yeah, at least as a possibility dog or cat or pet of any sort is suffering anything to get that test. You yeah. know, yeah. we didn't get even go test. down cancer road, which we know, uh, you know, both of ours died from cancer. I, I, every time I turn around, someone's dog is dying of cancer. Yeah. I'd love to have you back. Uh, if you, if you'd have us to, to have a, that discussion too, because. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd, yeah. I'd love to. And, and, and hopefully give you guys an update, you know, as, as time goes on, because we have a lot of things again in the pipeline and you know, I'll keep you guys posted on, on things as they come up. And I'd love to, love to chat, love to be back. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. I think we both could have talked to Dr. Madigan for hours. Oh, uh, I, I know I could have, I was geeking out. I, I geek out on stuff like this. Uh, I think there's so much important information in that interview. Uh, and I want to say thank you. Uh, and Dr. Madigan, 
it was fantastic, and I, I can't wait to talk to him again. Uh, it, it's amazing, and I, I don't know who else is going to have nightmares about a um, kissing bug biting them and pooping in them, but I will because that's just disgusting. And, you know, mosquitoes love me, so I'm sure kissing bugs do too. So, um, yeah, but no, it was it's very interesting to learn about how that how it all works. And then, of course, just hearing about this disease. And I, I think as a concerted effort, all you fellow dog nerds out there, we need to ask our vets about this, get our dogs and cats and other pets tested for this. Because we could potentially be saving lives. You know, there's, yeah. there's, you know, inflammation is something that this disease causes. And I know that inflammation and cancer go hand in hand. So that's something that I would like to ask Dr. Madigan about. Inflammation in the body is the biggest problem, especially in, a, in Western culture. That it's it's incredible, and, and not just cancer, but other illnesses yeah, and heart um, disease, cancer, probably uh, autoimmune diseases too. Yes, inflammation is the key, and and I was this was fascinating, and uh, I think it's one of the most important episodes, if not the most important episode we've ever done, and. Yeah, yeah, really, 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 really interesting. Yeah, that- so please share this far and wide. Tell your friends about Chagas disease. Um, Tell people where they can find us. Yes, you can find us everywhere online at Dog Nerd Show. So everywhere on social. And then dognerdshow at gmail.com if you'd like to drop us a line. We love getting your comments. So yeah. comment below if you've dealt with Chagas disease before, if you got as creeped out as I did about the uh, transmission of the disease, or if you just have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, we could really use your help. And it's super simple to do is give us a thumbs up if you liked our content. That helps us. And then also, if it's not too much to ask, we would love it if you would subscribe. And once you subscribe, you can hit the notification bell. It'll ring a bell every time we have one of these shows, which is... Typically, almost always, every two weeks. Sometimes we miss life. Uh, life gets in the way sometimes, but we enjoy doing these. We enjoy interacting with you guys, and thank you so much for tuning in. I love when you hit subscribe. It makes me really happy. And um, hey, maybe for every new subscriber, Dansby gets a bow tie. What do you think about that? Or a toy, or something special? We're gonna have so many. We're gonna have so many subscribers. We're gonna have so many subscribers. We're gonna we're gonna go poor. Yeah, we're gonna go poor buying bow ties. We're so trying. We're trying to up those subscription numbers. May, so. Maybe when we get another one hundred subscribers, Dansby gets a new bow tie. Okay, a hundred subscribers and Dansby gets a bow tie. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. That cool. Works. And then maybe if we get to a thousand more subscribers, ooh, thousand more subscribers. You the the thousand subscriber a thousand more or when we hit a thousand. I don't know. I think I, I, we'll, we'll decide. But then you'll we're gonna give away some. Okay. Oh yeah. For yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't. I don't know what it is yet. It'll probably be something from the Helen and Thistle store, which, by the way, you can go to on Etsy. But we we would really uh, we really thank you guys, and and it's and that's heartfelt. We love you guys. Yeah. So mm-hmm. until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.